And we've got two speakers, and we'll take questions after the speakers. Um, uh, we were going to hear from Kevin Fong shortly. Uh, you might have heard him on, heard him on radio recently. I, don't know. I heard, heard him last week on radio. I haven't listened to this week's radio for uh, program that he's probably uh, done this week. Uh, but first of all, we have Professor uh, Geeta Nagand, and Geeta is the Vice Chair of British Red Cross. She's also Lead Consultant in Reproductive Medicine at St. George's Hospital and the founder and trustee of Create Health Foundation, a UK women's health charity. Geeta, welcome, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. Um, it's a great honor to be here today. Um, it's what an incredible day um, to absorb so much information, and I feel really privileged to be here uh, at a session with um, Sir Michael Marwat, the pundit, the global pundit when it comes to addressing health inequalities and telling us what to do and what not to do, and so thank you. Uh, so I am going to be talking today um, a little bit about what we are doing at the British Red Cross, and then moving on to the work I have been doing in addressing health inequalities on behalf of our foundation, which is a women's health charity, Create Health Foundation, and just a mention about the gender health gap, which is an inequality that exists in our country, and then maybe some reflections, leadership reflections at the end. So as you heard earlier from our chair, Liz Padmore, um, the UK Health and Social Services seems to be the best kept secret for British Red Cross, but it is huge. It is helping a lot of people around the country because we are there everywhere. We are there at community levels, we are there at national level, regional level. So we are doing a lot of work which many are not aware of in our country. So over 150 con contracts with health and social care agencies across our country. So we are a, a huge provider to the National Health Service and also 30 high intensity user services across our country. So there's work going on every single day with with volunteers helping and amazing staff. So many people we support face health inequalities. We map our services to review how we serve people who are in Code 20 health inclusion groups and by area of deprivation to concentrate on people who face the greatest challenges in our country. So as you can see from this data that we have got here looking at clients according to IMD decline, which is the index for multiple deprivation, we serve a lot of people, 35% of our clients reside in core 20 areas. So it tells us how much the Red Cross is doing. So when you look at the outcomes of our services, which is just incredible, this data that we have got, um, looking at the outcomes from 2023, January to December 2023, this is the actual data, 93% showed an increase in health activation, 98% of our service users said the service was extremely good. 89% of people reported improved well-being at the end of their support. So taking people out of hospital, taking care of, the, of them at home and many other services. And more than 73% of people felt that they had more control of their health at the end of their support. And the list goes on. And social value of more than 6,000 pounds per client. So it goes to show, as it was shown in one of our feedback slides, the enormous difference that we are doing at the British Red Cross when it comes to addressing our country's health and social care and addressing those who suffer from health inequalities. 54% reduction in accident emergency attendance, 50% reduction in ambulance conveyances, and 48% reduction in liaison psychiatry attends for our mental health services. A huge difference that is happening and is something I wanted to make sure we shout about it today. Now I move on to some of the work that I have been involved in and leading as regards to women's health. And in particular, the first part of it would be around uh, pregnancy and uh, black, Asian, um, uh, and minority ethnic population. 
So this is the work that was published by Create Health Foundation in November 2023. We presented it in Parliament, and then we have set up now working groups to take this forward. The full report is available on our website for those of you who are interested. We decided to look at, as you all know, we have sta shocking statistics in our country. Okay, it is something that the disparity in maternal health outcomes across ethnic minorities is shocking in our country. The Embrace report, 2022, reports black women were nearly four times more likely to die than white women, and Asian women were nearly twice more likely to die than white women, either during pregnancy or up to one year after delivery. And the report also showed that improvements in care may have made a difference to the outcome of 38% of women who died. That is worrying. And one in nine of those women who died during or up to a year after pregnancy in our country were at severe and multiple disadvantage. Women living in the most deprived areas have the highest maternal mortality rates. And I'm somebody who's been following maternal mortality rates across the world because I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, although I don't practice obstetrics anymore. But I know how shocking this is data from UK, and these graphs will tell you about that. Ethnic groups as well as deprived areas, how shocking the maternal mortality is in our country. So when we decided to do our project and our research from our foundation, we decided going to antenatal, late antenatal care or intrapartum care is probably too late for intervention, and therefore we should be looking at preconception. And for this, and also intrauterine environment. So we all know that preconception care influences maternal and neonatal outcomes. And there's a lot of data about that, about how many more than a third of women seek better antenatal advice if preconception advice is given. And also we could be preventing 17% of neonatal mortality if we advised. And so preconception care is hugely important. In fact, there was a paper published by an IHR evidence paper last year in December. That paper showed that 92% of women have at least one risk factor before pregnancy. And nearly 50% of women suffer from being overweight or obesity. And nearly 40% of women have history of miscarriage or pregnancy loss. And nearly 30% of women have at least one physical health condition. And nearly 10% of women have a mental health condition. So imagine all that, putting that together. If we don't address that during pre-pregnancy period, how do we expect better outcomes? And also intrauterine environment is equally important for those who are familiar. Uh, David Barker from Southampton published this incredible report about Barker hypothesis about how intrauterine environment, fetal programming is important for the long-term health outcomes of children and how, what metabolic disorders they develop later in life. So we decided we will look at pre-pregnancy period and pregnancy experiences in order to address or improve maternal and fetal outcomes. So we did that. Our methodology was looking at academic peer-reviewed papers. So we looked at 35 academic peer-reviewed papers, scholarly articles, more than 15 advocacy research papers, um, five advocacy research papers, surveys with women, hundreds of women, and also semi-structured interviews. So together, we thought we would collect the best possible evidence. So we looked at awareness, what women know about maximizing the chances of healthy pregnancy and how to get support in doing so. Access, the extent to which information and services are open and are easy to use for all women. And then care, the actual care, how women are treated when using pre-pregnancy and maternity services. So um, I, I'm not going to go through the detail because I haven't got the time, but if you're interested, you can look at the full report on our website. So the key findings we got as regards to awareness of pre-pregnancy support in our survey, 74% of Asian and 58% of black women 
are more likely to believe than white women, which is 45%, that having more knowledge of pre-pregnancy services would have helped them to have a better pregnancy. When it came to access of pre-pregnancy support to pre-pregnancy support, our report showed, our survey showed as well, that significant barriers and gaps were reported by BME women in communicating their options, choices, and needs. Amongst BAME women, community and social groups are better trusted, I think we all know that now, and more often used as sources of information and support than for white women. And overall, white women reported trust in health services in the UK at a higher rate than Asian women and black women. When it came to quality of care, two thirds of women from BAME background that were interviewed reported feeling discriminated against, judged, or otherwise treated differently by healthcare staff. That keeps coming again and again, and our reported supported that, even when it comes to pre-pregnancy time. And then their feelings of pain were dismissed. So in that big full report, we came up with recommendations. And you will find that none of them are particularly new. You hear these recommendations all the time. But we felt that the terminology around pre-pregnancy advice was not um, defined. Different people, different parts of the country were using different terminologies when it came to pre-pregnancy care. So we said in the report, unify the terminology around pre-pregnancy services, support services to deliver ethnically specific and culturally sensitive pre-pregnancy advice, and then improving education to primary care and target areas of high deprivation to have local pregnancy and end-to-end -end maternity services and collect the data because there is so many gaps in collection of data in our NHS. So collect the data, in other words, improve data collection at a national level to capture the whole pregnancy experience that includes pre-pregnancy experience and to conduct regular local audits of care during pregnancy, including data on ethnicity. So we need to address the barriers to provide this. And we also need to look at nice guidelines. I just want to talk a, for a minute or two about gender health gap that exists in our country. It is once again shocking. We are talking about 51% of our population when we are talking about women and girls. So the gender health gap in the UK is shockingly bad. UK has the largest gender health gap in the G20 countries. It is the 12th largest globally. Less than 2.5% of publicly funded research is dedicated to reproductive health when one in three women suffer from reproductive health problems sometime in their lives. For example, Erectile dysfunction, which affects 19% of men, there's five times more research funding than premenstrual syndrome, which affects 90% of women. Around 60% of ovarian cancer cases are diagnosed too late in our country. Cancer Research UK confirms that. It takes nearly eight years for women to get the diagnosis of endometriosis. Women are 50% more likely to receive an initial wrong diagnosis when they're having a heart attack. When it comes to dementia, they receive worse medical treatment than men. By the way, all this is data-driven, evidence-based. And after surgery, women are half as likely to receive painkillers than men. Yes, women live longer, but they spend more of their lives in poor health, so quality of life matters. So this is why when it comes to health inequalities, I don't want to kind of, I, it's quite important that we address this huge gap that exists when it comes to this women's health. And that is something we, I believe very strongly need to address urgently. So when it comes to Leadership reflections as regards to the work that we have been doing. I really believe there's 
I wish Lord Darcy was here now. There's an urgent need to review the women's health strategy that the last government produced. The reason I believe we have to do that, because it wasn't part of uh, Lord Darcy's review, is because of a number of gaps that exist in that review. First of all, the data that collected was not based on NHS services review. It was entirely based on a public consultation, which is called for evidence, okay? Around 110,000 women across our country um, actually fed back. But there was a real underrepresentation of women from BME communities as well as vulnerable groups. Massive underrepresentation. Therefore, we cannot draw conclusions. And guess what? There were no questions asked about sexual orientation. That means LGBTQ plus community were more or less excluded from the data, from, from conclusions, because we never asked those questions. So there's a real need to address that. And on the back of it, this year, the government published, uh, the previous government published reports on women's health hubs, and they have been piloting it for since 2022 beginning. Once again, when it comes to women's health hubs, there's no consistency in definition, there's no consistency in staffing, there's no consistency in application, there's no consistency in what they deliver. Some of them could be virtual, some of them maybe a bit of cervical screening available. We need one-stop shops for women with ultrasound facilities and diagnostic facilities. Women deserve that. If we want to change outcomes, we need to give them a quick diagnosis so that they can enter early treatment. And when you look at all of these health inequalities, when it comes to BME community or low socioeconomic groups, we really do not have that emphasis in our medical school curriculum. And I think there may be a need to look at that, as well as some conditions like menopause, fertility, they need to be taught in schools, okay? Because there isn't anything emphasis on that. And we also need nice guidelines that address inequalities and the conditions and how they are considered as high risk groups so that we can get primary care to look at them differently so that they enter a pathway to get an early diagnosis and get onto the waiting list to get treatment quickly. We need to raise awareness through community platforms, but most importantly, we need a whole government approach. I don't think we can fix this with DHSC alone. We need uh, so many departments to come together when it comes to addressing health inequalities to fix that. So we really need an interdepartmental approach when it comes to this. And I strongly believe we need to work with all sectors, which is why the Red Cross, the British Red Cross, has such an important part to play to work with the part, as a partner of the National Health Service. So in some way, we need all public, private, and voluntary sector to come together to fix our nation's health. And we have to try and fix services to meet the local needs of the population so that we then address inequalities, otherwise, we are inadvertently going to be widening inequalities. And I think we need some Marmot champions. And I don't think we have had that. We need Marmot champions. I know it's a tough one, but I think if we make Marmot champions, then we actually, I think, can fix it at some stage. It may not be quick, but we need that healthy quality leadership at all levels with accountability. They are my reflections. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.